Hello, and welcome to Lean Into Green. I'm your host, Jenny LaMorgan, and I'm excited to be here with my guest today, Judy Gron. And I'll introduce Judy and talk about who she is, but first I want to share a little bit about Lean Into Green for those of you listening for the first time. At Lean Into Green, we learn from some of the best experts in this field of green lifestyles, and you will discover how going green enriches your life, your health, your wealth, and your happiness in so many important and inspiring ways. And you'll learn the many impacts that your own green lifestyle makes on the planet and on peace and lasting sustainability. You will deepen the way that you understand and experience your own green lifestyle. And that's what Lean Into Green is all about. I'm a green entrepreneur and owner of GreenWomanStore.com. I've learned a lot interviewing our green lifestyle experts, and I know you'll be glad that you've listened in. So let me tell you about our guest today, Judy Gron. Judy is an amazing poet. She's a writer and author. She's a teacher and professor and one of the founding mothers of the lesbian movement here in the United States. Judy co-directs the Women's Spirituality course. It's a master's degree course at Sophia University. This is a two-year women-centered program which meets online throughout the academic year and for three residencies held on campus in beautiful Palo Alto, California. Graduates use their degrees as a catalyst for change in themselves, in their communities, and in the world. Welcome, Judy Gron, to Lean Into Green. Well, thank you so much, Jenny. I'm really glad to be here with you today. And I'm glad to have the, the pieces that you bring um, to the, to the dis- discussion uh, conversation on sustainability. So let's start with women's spirituality. Spirituality. When we say women's spirituality, what are we talking about today in our conversations? Uh, well, it, I think probably depends on who is saying what about it. But um, as you know, this is uh, this is a field that has been developing over the last 40 years. Uh, it grew out of grassroots uh, and also academic women. Uh, wanting some kinds of changes from what they began very early on defining as a patriarchal world that we've been living in uh, and that continues to spread around the world. So we wanted to know what um, contributions women had uh, ever contributed to uh, spirituality and to human culture. So... um, hundreds of people engaged in all kinds of research and uh, wrote books and uh, surfaced with all kinds of uh, graphic material. So uh, we learned then that we have a history that goes back behind the patriarchy, that there are historic moments when the patriarchy started, uh, and that um, while patriarchy has contributed a great deal in the way of culture, the fundaments of culture belong to women uh, and started uh, before that or continue in uh, certain uh, tribal uh, organizations that continue to exist where women are looked to as um, people who engage directly with the spirit of the world uh, and who uh, have a particular connection to nature. This this is not saying that men don't have connections to nature, but the connections that women have to nature are uh, deeply mythic and they're deeply embedded in people's cultures. When people say, all my relations, you know, they're talking about a relationship that uh, has been uh, cut off uh, by the patriarchy. So spirituality is a kind of a pantheistic uh, movement uh, and people can come into it from any religion and from any point of view or no religion at all, and they're looking for what is spiritual, which is to say what is imminent and energetic in nature, between nature and humans. Are you still there? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. No. That's a long answer, I know. but Well, but it, it gives us um, an understanding of of what women's spirituality encompasses. And um, and it and it is uh, a part of so many different traditions around the world that we um, I know science is showing us through 
new archaeological digs and interpretations of old digs, um, how we lived in connection with nature for tens of thousands of years. And that's what you're talking about. Your life's research and life's work has been all about uncovering these ancient connections and then teaching us how quite naturally and instinctually we carry these lifestyle connections forward today. And um, I believe that what we're calling sustainability today is, in fact, our ancient way of living um, in respect of Mother Nature, Mother Earth. So um, are we remembering these ancient roots? And is going green, in fact, our ancient spirituality and way of living um, from your research? Yes, uh, and it takes both. It takes the contemporary scientists who are uh, moving ever closer to reconnecting to some of the uh, older wisdoms, but they're doing it with a brand new set of tools and a set of approaches. Um, but uh, standing directly in back of them are uh, all kinds of women-centered uh, wisdoms of various kinds that were and are uh, deeply connected to nature. I mean, my own idea about it is that, uh, and I'm not alone in this, that uh, we just, we do better, we make greener choices, we make um, more earth-centered choices when we have ways to really identify with nature. Uh, and we have been cut off from that for such a long time for certain, I think, patriarchal reasons. Just um, just to take an example, just to think of, of microbes and the work that's been, being done now to uh, help us work through um, the prejudices that we've developed in the last 50 years toward microbes. We, people couldn't see microbes until there were microscopes, and then immediately they were identified as enemies, as something that would cause an illness, and therefore antibiotics uh, rose up. And now science is understanding the need for probiotics, which is to be mm -hmm. for um, the little beings and to be in favor of them because we're understanding that they uh, help us live and inhabit our lives and we inhabit their world rather than that they have invaded our life. Which, you know, when I say that invaded, I'm using, um, I'm using a metaphor from war, um, which is, is it's a male ritual and it's so much the way that Western culture has learned to think about how to solve problems through um, through warfare. So to attack illness has, you know, long been something that um, is in our vocabulary, and we need to change that because that's not reality. It's not helpful. Um, so that that's just one example, but there are of many that could be used. Well, and I think it's an example of how science is changing our reality. It, the science, it, I call it patriscience, that the science that we have today, and it's coming much more full circle now with matriscience or the science of, of ancient times that included nature and that included the wholeness of that spiritual experience. Right, and of, of once once you have connected to a spiritual connect connection with nature, it's understanding that it's not nature in some abstract sense, but rather it's the beings that surround us every day, all day long, all the time, that um, that live, you know, right outside of our door or that uh, have branches that hang overhead, that to understand these as beings and to connect with them in any way that we can, any way that we can go about trying to help ourselves identify as living uh, not in an alienated, mechanistic world, but in a very, very alive world that's full of intelligent beings, many of whom are trying to even connect with us, and some have just given up uh, because of the, this, the disconnections that have gone on. Mm -hmm. So any ways that we can help each other make those connections, um, you know, without going crazy every time a tree is cut down, is going to help us make many more uh, good decisions 
and cho- and lifestyle choices and so on. I, I like the quote of yours when you say we must go back to go forward, um, and that's what you're talking about, going back to that wholeness um, to go forward sustainably. Yes, and I'm glad you added sustainable to that because um, – it's easy to think of going forward as you know, a more mechanistic progress, and um, that we need so much more than that. We need uh, sustainability to to just be part of the way that we breathe through the day. So I thank mm-hmm. you for adding that to that mm-hmm. quote. But yes, that's been that's been one of the reasons to have uh, an academic women's spirituality program is to be able to study where people have ever been with their wisdoms and with their connections to nature to get some sense of where we might uh, go and how we might change these mass cultures that are, um, uh, you know, heedlessly going forward, you know, the obvious things that that people know about of, uh, you know, being driven by imperialist capitalisms of various kinds and that's just not good enough it it just isn't um it isn't giving us the kinds of lives that we need and it's putting us right now into a crisis economically many economically people. and our food systems uh, yes and the you know. food system uh and the the illness system the uh the phenomenal um yeah. Which there, you know, I'm I'm thinking about the uh, the obesity ac- uh, epidemics that are being recognized as part of uh, the world that seems to go hand in hand with an overuse of antibiotics. Mm. So, mm. Uh, you know, that information is starting to surface. I think it will be turned around, you know, really quickly. Uh, but because of people paying attention to positive relations to nature and not just that nature attacks us <laughs> in uh, some kind of warlike way, but rather that uh, we're all related and our relationships include all of nature. You know, this issue of being in relationship with and and having that be something that women in general, um, are very prone to incorporate into all of our decisions and and life and way of going forward. Um, It's just been a common thread with these Lean Into Green interviews. It comes in from all different areas of uh, sustainability and of, of how the world is changing. As we see women rising globally and women's credibility certainly increasing in all areas of human development. Can you tell us the importance of women as central to human development and sustainability in in our ancient past, but also today? Oh, that, okay. <laughs> that's, <laughs> such a, that's a two-year question, Jenny. But, um, but the centrality of women, you know. Totally. In, the centrality of women and the reason why uh, – I would devote so many years to being uh, part of a very exciting program that's teaching women-centered knowledge is exactly that. Uh, for one thing, women-centered knowledge has been suppressed for at least 400 years in the West and probably much longer, um, but certainly for that long, uh, in the interest of men developing their own sciences, which they've now had their uh, chance to do that and we've looked at it and decided that now it's time for women to step forward once again but um, you know as I know you know in exploring uh, menstruation I decided to explore menstruation a long time ago uh, because my mother was interested in science and I wanted to know how women had contributed to science and to human culture And I thought that menstruation would be a good place to begin because surely I thought calendars, at least, would be attributable to us. This was like back in the 70s. Um, And then just doing about 20 years of research with that, uh, what fell out was an entire uh, new origin story um, 
uh, which I wrote down in a, in a book, Blood, Bread, and Roses, how menstruation created the world that credits uh, menstruation with having created human culture. Um, not women alone, but uh, quite remarkably, men and women together developing uh, blood rituals, but that stem from the c- connection uh, between women's uh, menstrual cycle and other cycles of nature. You know, most obviously the lunar cycle, but uh, they synced up with other cycles as well. And then they uh, started pulling our culture out, out, outside of ourselves in these magnificent ways uh, to contain their knowledge uh, and using seclusions of women together and of men together. Uh, to help create culture, and these were like these little womb-like seclusions um, that began uh, containing all manner of uh, of bits of human culture that have accumulated over time. So uh, I find that so exciting, uh, that kind of uh, research that is possible with this, because the uh, the material... Uh, and linguistic and and so on and gestural uh, evidences of it are all around us. Every single lineage uh, can connect to this idea without very much uh, deep digging at all. You just need to understand how to use the theory as a kind of, of decoder to find all manner of ways that women have uh, impacted culture from a long, long way back, the elements of culture, like uh, simple things, like just connection with the plant world, for example. Um, it seems evident now that uh, ancestral women saw certain plants as being just like themselves, as being menstruating mothers. And in those mm-hmm. older times, Menstrual blood was understood as something that would form up into a baby or form up into a fruit or form up into a vegetable, form up into a flower and so on. So, uh, you know, that connection I don't think has ever been broken between uh, women and the plant world. I think it's just we're wedded to that. And it comes up in so many different cultural ways. Um, that it's it's right there. You just need to just scratch the surface, and there it all is. Well, you've certainly um, uncovered a lot of it for us in in your in your many books, and certainly in uh, Blood, Bird, and Roses. I know you have a story, a horticultural story of the connections between root crops like Bolivian potatoes and menstruation. Um, can you tell us a little bit about some of the some of the ways that we're carrying these ancient techniques, ancient green living techniques forward? Sure. Uh, Let me just think about one. There's one that's um, it's in the Gnostic Gospels, uh, and it's an origin of food crops uh, that I immediately, I I recognized it as what I call metaphormic. I I had to make up a term for what these uh, sort of idea ideas were that were contained in bits of culture that also were connected to menstruation. So I made up this word, metaphor. And um, just as one example, um, there is an account, and it's called a, an origin story, um, that uh, virgins uh, spilled their blood on the ground, and from from these grew figs, uh, grapes and pomegranates i think those are the three crops uh and that that's confirmation of my suspicion that people were were drawn to these plants and therefore began to take care of them as if they were relatives by bringing them home and dressing them and watering them and feeding them and you know petting them and tending them and giving them offerings and so on until horticulture was uh, created, so that that was just that's one example of a confirmation because the blood of virgins can only be menstrual blood. This is not sacrificial blood. It's not saying somebody cut them, but rather they had their own blood, meaning they had come of age. They hadn't yet had a baby, so they were virginal, 
and they um, they were using their menstrual blood to feed these plants. But there's also, beyond that, there's also that these plants were understood as menstruating in and of themselves. It's most obvious with grapes and uh, pomegranates. But uh, there's also these kinds of connection with all kinds of other uh, other plants, cacao and uh, cola bean and um, cho- you know um, coffee and uh, all manner of things that actually in in their natural form they aren't even food, but they were attractive to our ancestors uh, who began to uh, tr- treat them, process them in similar ways that they were doing with themselves to regulate their energies. And horticulture came of that. It's not it's not very complicated once you uh, begin doing a little bit of the research. And I've done it with about, I don't know, 40 plants. I just haven't published that article yet. But um, the one that you're talking about is up uh, on the Metaformia Journal up online. And it's about... Um, women in Bolivia planting potatoes, only the women plant the potatoes. That's, a, you know, a clue. Why would that be? Um, and it turns out that they they uh, carry them in aprons around their waist, right near their uterus, uteri. And they plant, when they plant them, they are understanding the potatoes to be a form of the menstrual blood of the earth or of Pachamama. So all mm-hmm. kinds of rituals would be uh, instituted around uh, these kinds of of ways of interacting with nature's beings that would uh, keep them related to human beings. And there's a wonderful uh, article, God, uh, Goddess Mothers of the Blood of Life, quoting you know an anthropologist who saw this and recorded it so that uh, I could use it as information. I don't mean she did it so that I could do that, but I mean I'm grateful that she did it so that then I could use it, you see. And you could use it. Another example of that, of, of women connecting in relationship. Being in, in relationship, relationship you bet. When, uh, okay. when women go to various places and uh, women who can record things go and ask questions of women, women-centered knowledge then surfaces and becomes a way that Western women can stop being quite so alienated and so male-identified as we have been in the past. And that's exciting. It's exciting not just for itself, but because it it puts women in the world in some way that we haven't been before with the, the male origin stories that we know so well from Genesis and also from uh, evolutionary theory that has made it seem as though the only thing women ever did was have babies and stay home while the men did everything. And that simply isn't true. Uh, So uh, once you get that, you get a whole lot. (laughs) And I I think that's why, uh, you know, you started doing this work in the 70s um, and along with, you know, a a handful of other women and, I, th- I think you must have felt for so long that you were ahead of your time, but it's all so timely right now, and the world is just moving in this in this feminine direction of opening up and sharing and um, the, not not being in competition with, but being in relationship with. And I think it must be very gratifying at this point in time for for all the work that you've done and the years that you've devoted to it to see it coming, having this course that you have now, um, teaching women spirituality as a master's program, who would have thought, to you know? Yeah, who would have thought? And uh, <laughs> this material that uh, we work with has spread out into the popular culture in all kinds of ways uh, that I, I don't even uh, stay on top of, so I can't really speak to it, but I just... Uh, know that it's happening and uh, see evidences of it uh, all over the place. Well, I want to read a little bit about what you say about the women who attend the master's program in women's spirituality that, that, you, that you, you've created, really. 
You say, our master's students are at a pivotal intersection where they feel life should have more purpose and meaning, or they're in search of a new kind of work and wanting to enhance their career while finding a deeper sense of meaning, or possibly they are called to explore their deepest inner longings, especially those that can't quite name. What is the Master's in Women's Spirituality curriculum that you offer at Sophia University. Just kind of give us an idea of of the curriculum and, and how you run the program. Okay, and uh, we're in the middle of changing it. We're in the middle of putting a great deal of it online because it's harder and harder for people to travel right now. So um, uh, we're putting a lot of it in online format, and that's very exciting. I at first I was skeptical about that, but the more that I see how that works, the the better I feel about it. So we connect with uh with the women uh face to face for a few days and then uh we have online classes that uh include embodiment, they include um ritual, they include the arts and they include scholarly study. Uh, so um, that's a that's a holistic approach to education, and it's a characteristic of this program that uh, we do uh, come at knowledge from those different perspectives, and we also have the understanding that people learn from uh, from different points of view. Some people learn better by hearing something out loud and others need to read it and others still need to see some pictures that go along with it or uh, do an exercise that allows them to experience it you know and embody it or even to do a dance so we have a number of dance teachers uh, in our program Uh, and for the scholarly content that there has been uh, the research of archaeomythologists, including, of course, the mother of that term and that field, Maria Gimbutas, but also there, uh, there have been other people who have been looking at uh, the uh, African diaspora or looking at archaeomythologies from around the world and tracing, um, you know, women-centered. Uh, figures or mythologies in various directions. There's also been work translating uh, literature from ancient Sumer, which was one of those places uh, that was a breadbasket for the world, and and it also was a place that created uh, so much culture uh, from studying the skies and identifying as deities, all these different sky elements, uh, developing city-states, and literacy itself, which is credited to women. It's credited to a goddess, Nisaba, goddess of writing. Uh, Unfortunately, that material was embedded in clay tablets in a desert area where it, it retained. I don't think it's accidental that um archaeologists uh, surfaced with this material about 100 years ago, and now we've been returned to pre-biblical texts, the texts that biblical stories and characters are based on. So we can see what was present in that time that was left out as the, the patriarchs diminished some of the older religions, and they also added their own elements to it. Um, and now we can see it's like looking in back of a curtain. It's just very amazing. So those things, plus uh, my own uh, metaphoric, I'm now calling it not a consciousness rather than a theory, um, it, because it's only a theory when you're learning to follow it. But it, it's now, um, my colleagues tell me, no, we're going to call this a consciousness because it's so obviously true. Um, so we teach that, and then uh, Shala McLeod teaches her marvelous art processes. We have Althea Walking Tree uh, does drumming with the students. The students share things in various ways. They learn marvelous uh, research 
uh, for, that's also women-centered, uh, Organic Inquiry, which was created by Diane Jeanette and uh, three other women out of the uh, old Institute of Transpersonal Psychology that takes a, it asks the question, what if research is sacred? Uh, how, do you, how does one do it then? And it centers very much in uh, people telling stories to each other and sharing their knowledge rather than uh, one superior eyeball staring at uh, others and, you know, trying to record what, um, trying to imagine what's going on. You've uh, changed a lot of the structure of education. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I would say that. <laughs> Yes, it's a very unique approach to education. Uh, Institute of Transpersonal Psychology developed some of this also uh, as they were interested in uh, eminence and they were interested in in no longer pathologizing uh, psychology, psychological states, but rather describing them as energetic. <clears throat> so much of this has to do with changing from a materialist view that things are simply mechanistic to a, a much more contemporary view that things are imminent um, and that they're in process. And more and more psychology is going in those directions, science of all kinds is going in those directions of a fluidity. Um, and that's that brings us back to a women-centered way of being. For sure. And how are the women that go through your program, how are they using their master's degree in women's spirituality? Um, let me just check here. I have a couple of things um, of what what some of our students are doing besides uh, Reka Kurup is uh, off in India saving uh, trees and uh, working with NGOs, and she also uh, works with children, had a really, really successful program here in the Bay Area with about eight different um, schools, um, pr uh, primary and secondary schools, teaching those children mindfulness in a way that actually worked. And they, the uh, incidences of violence dropped from something like 600 to something like eight. You know, I'm, I don't have the figures right in front of me, but it was an astonishing turnaround that, you know, it just, it's like, why isn't that part of education and such a great big part of education that it would stop um, this mm -hmm. mindless violence that happens when uh, kids don't have any way to learn how to control themselves, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and as we know, ecofeminism has long uh, understood that there is a connection between being violent towards uh, other people and being violent toward the earth. So it, it just seems crucial to do this kind of work. Uh, Barbara Fram is a, a beautiful, beautiful dancer, uh, she dances about the bees, and she does her dances to help people identify with bees. Uh, she has worked with women from Bulgaria who still have traditional dances that honor the bees from you know, prehistoric times. Um, and she uh, continues to train with uh, Vandana Shiva, who is uh, an eco-feminist mm -hmm. activist from India. So that's one example. Another example um, that's not quite so obvious, uh, Kira Smith um, graduated quite a while ago. Was uh, She was a dancer herself, and she and her husband uh, run a community center in Brooklyn it, in which they encourage parents to come in with their children, and they all learn music together, and it's folk music. Um, so uh, it's a gathering place that's extremely important for uh, bonding between uh, parents and children. 
and once again uh the alienation that uh that the patriarchy keeps you know demanding that we be work either worker bees or unemployable take your choice um mm-hmm. but but not be whole people uh by making people whole uh, in this way they serve as community center and they were very very uh important at the time of the recent uh flooding that happened uh in Brooklyn and people were seeking them out um for shelter um Mandisa Wood is another uh graduate and she also t- is a faculty and she is using African matriarchal business models uh merged with community activism to um uh, demonstrate uh, the ways that urban agriculture can counteract violence and economic hardship and to inspire uh, young people who uh, may be disenchanted with learning. And I mean, maybe they are disenchanted with learning in the ways that the schools have let them down so badly. So she manages a weekly organic farmer's market, collaborating with local farmers and also with the Oakland Unified School District. Um, and she just simply teaches them how to identify with and appreciate or organic vegetables and fruits and where they come from and teaches them how to plant them and so on. Um, so her educational and teaching experience is rooted in uh, ethical research methods and diversity work, as well as that she uh, is a dancer and a dance teacher, so she incorporates the arts um, and you know that's so that's completely in line with what we do in our program so many examples of teaching relationship you know and yes and that's re- you really have a curriculum of of connectedness yes and and that's what your research that you're bringing forward from ancient times that it's that it's how we lived and all the evidence of it and um, bringing that forward and then sending women out into the world to teach it in, in their many different ways and their, with their many different gifts. Um, really world-changing, life-changing for the women and for everybody they touch. For everybody they touch. You know, if it's uh, their own children, uh, that's still life-changing. Uh, but But these are women who... Uh, they they work with young girls. They uh, invent new initiations uh, to do. They uh, form, they hang a shingle out and become entrepreneurs of various kinds, or they go back into corporate life. But in the meantime, they uh, they write books and they or they you know teach sustainable methods inside of a business model. So. Um, or or they go on to become psychologists but it's but it's psychology with a broader perspective uh mm-hmm. because of having gone through our program and so on so uh and there's there are infinite examples that I could give of uh artists and um and writers and painters and dancers and so on uh and 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 these people may also hold corporate jobs or they may decide they can't stand that anymore and so they uh they go in the direction of what you might call NGOs or um you know non profits. Um as women have always done, you know, a life uh sharing knowledge with people and uh learning how in this American context people can take care of each other in much better ways and make better decisions. I know, Judy, that you travel to Kerala, Indian, India, um, and I know you've done that for several years. And I, I think you must have a group of women that you're familiar with there that you that you go back to and work with. Um, and I really don't know anything about your work there. Do you want to share a little bit about that with us? Well, I go. It's my great privilege to go. Uh, I think my colleague Diane Jeanette is somebody who has worked there. Um, she studied. We we did co research together uh, to get our to, to get our PhDs in women's spirituality, and we uh, 
you know, we held the camera for each other and stayed awake through the heat to uh, remember which questions to ask. And so I had a fabulous time uh, embedding ourselves in a community where we were completely dependent on the neighborhood women. Um, and I was researching. I, I wanted to know if there was a connection between goddess rituals and menstrual rituals, which there certainly is. Um, but she was researching this amazing, uh, enormous offering that is given. It's the largest gathering of women in the world. It's a million to two million women gather in the capital city of Kerala every year, uh, and they light fires outside and they cook porridge for the, the goddess Bhagavati. She wanted to know why. Um, and... In doing that research, uh, she, um, uh, we just we just interviewed so many different people and got to know so many different people, including a group of feminists who were there and some uh, some people who remain, you know, lifelong friends. And it's uh, Diane is um, that's her spiritual journey uh, and her practice is to go back. She goes back every year and. Um, uh, does the Pangala ritual, and it's a very it's a, it's more difficult than it sounds to do it. Uh, so I've done it maybe three times, but she's done it, you know, a, fifteen or twenty times, um, and she's well known there for for that. So that's a connection, and I have connections to people through her, but I have to credit her with that. But I have a different connection. Uh, to Kerala and to India, and in that my, my work uh, surfaces there every once in a while. And uh, there's a, a young and very brilliant um, filmmaker, Vipin Vijay. I was just just surfing the web one day, and um, lo and behold, he had made a film, a 55-minute film uh, about my book, Blood, Bread, and Roses. <laughs> It's a marvelous film. It was it was up posted up there for a while. It isn't there now, but we'll try to get it back. It's called The Flowering Tree, or Pumadam. And uh, I didn't know anything about it, but it seems that he just fell in love with my work and some of my ideas, you know, after reading uh, an article of mine called Moose, Foos, and Famous about origins, taking control of origin stories. Uh, and not letting the dominant culture be the only one who can tell origin stories and not letting uh, the critical theorists tell us that we're not allowed to tell any uh, overview stories because if we don't tell them, somebody else will, uh, and somebody else does, and they're not good stories. They don't help us. So um, he just totally believes in uh, metaphoric consciousness enough to have made this film. And we'll try to get it posted up again in the next year. Okay, we have a link to to your um to different um delicious pages on your websites and and your I think you have a couple of different websites. Oh, great. Yes. Well, the yeah. the website that I I recommend people look at is you know Met, the Metaformia Journal because it's got I don't know, eight or nine articles up there. Uh, and you keep it pretty current, it looks no, like. No, I don't keep it current at all. I'm just, my attention is just always pulled off in so many different directions. I wish I could keep it all current. Uh, but I do my best, you know. I try to do my best uh, to do it. And then I have my own website. I don't really keep that one up very well either, but I have somebody who's trying to help me with that one. Judy um, Gronin Cyberspace. Yes, space. Judy Gronin Cyberspace. Yes. Space. I like that. I love title. it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. All right. So now I, you you have written so many books. Um, I have to say that your modern day descent myth, Queen of Swords, I love that. It's um, you know, there's parts. You're such an amazing poet. There's pieces of your poetry where I can feel the shift. You know your your poetry is so truthful, and it is it's transformational. 
so there's there's parts of that of that book of that book is an entire poem um and it's all about how women experience that monthly descent into our what we call depression or the need mm. for hibernation mm. um so here we are at and at fall equinox so i'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the earth descent and um, what season in the Earth's cycles would we call her menstrual cycle? <laughs> um, you know, when oh, is she? Funny yeah, go ahead. Yeah, when is she germinating? And you know that feeling when you're hanging from the sky and you don't know what's coming next. That mm. kind of, you know, that we experience in the winter. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> if uh, if we live in a place where there is winter, right? You well, know, even that's. That's an interesting question, and I, that was one of the questions I wanted to know about uh, if, when I I discovered in um, in India that only like a hundred years ago, in the south, uh, there was a three day uh, celebration of the Earth menses that would happen um, at the opening of the hot season, and uh the earth they uh the, no one be, no one would work during that period of time they acted toward her just as uh people act, acted toward uh women and their menses that they don't do any work other people cook for them so there would be offerings to the earth um an interesting piece of this is that debts would be absolved don't you wish that the banks would engage in uh, an annual mm-hmm. menses celebration in which they would wipe <laughs> out the debt <laughs> and let us oh. all start over again. Isn't that a beautiful idea? What a concept, yeah. I mean, what a concept indeed. Um, so, but uh, to answer your question, it really, and this is what is so marvelous about all of this, is that it depends where you live. So um, the, the New Year's, I think, the New Year's, frequently mark a time that um that people would understand as uh, as a menses but it also depends on the agricultural cycles and so on um and you know people had that farmers almanac was was by the moon until very recently but i would have to say it really you need to look around and make that decision yourself about when you think that the earth itself is is holding still in some kind of way and it might be um at the time of of darkness or it might be the time of incredible heat it would depend on what you were using this whole idea for isn't that marvelous it's not fixed in any way it mm-hmm. it's it's a human idea and we have applied it in in contextually that is to say it's a relational idea to begin with so uh for for christianity that time is easter when the god dies and is reborn 3 days later so you can you can see in back of that uh you know estrus and ishtar and uh and the refurbishing of of earth in springtime but in Kerala, this would have been at at the time right before the rains came, and the rains would have been this very important piece of what was happening uh, with the earth. So it, this require this isn't mechanistic at all. It really requires us to understand what does the earth need. You know, is this the time that we need to be? Uh, watering everything, including the wild trees nearby, um, because uh, it's the dry season or because it's a drought is happening because of global warming or because of just seasonal changes. What do we need to pay attention to, in other words? So I think that's a very interesting question, and I'm going to think about it in relationship to my own neighborhood. <laughs> Right, you know, right here and now. What does that mean? Um, because I know it won't mean the same thing that it might mean for, you know, some people in in Bolivia where it's Pachamama and it's 
a different hemisphere and it's a different time time of year and so on. Mm-hmm. Interesting, and huh? Culturally specific, like feminism is and right. sustainability is yes. and all, all of these different things that right. are right. And like gender bending is, or you know, uh, mm-hmm. everything mm-hmm. having to do with uh, with transgender um, issues at, and beauties of various kinds. That it's culture specific what it means mm-hmm. to have that particular orientation or designation or biology or whatever. And the importance of the different roles in the yes. different cultures. Right? right, and the importance of time and place. Mm-hmm. Now, you've won recently, very recently, you've won several awards for your newest book, A Simple Revolution, about ushering in the evolution of lesbian feminism here in the United States. And I read A Simple Revolution when it first came out, published by Aunt Lute. Uh-huh. Um, and you mention in there that when you women were living together in in your I, you know we can call it separation or cultural uh immersion you know where you really needed to immerse yourself into lesbian sensibilities and right and we we really did separate from everybody in order to do that immersion and that that's a good word for it a cultural immersion um people do that sort of thing all the time and and everybody got so excited that we were doing it and i just couldn't imagine why women would go and and be entirely as they say by ourselves <laughs> but um we were learning about ourselves and learning about women and how we could be of service to women. It was we were very service oriented. Well, I think that some, you know, there's different groups of us that do this. There's at the Michigan Women's Music Festival, there's a a tent and a and a patio area for women of color. There's, you know, different areas, there's different opportunities, not a lot of opportunities, but there's different ways that we separate out from the dominant culture take some time to be with our root yes mm-hmm. sensibilities whatever that is and and we enrich ourselves and we're able to to not be impacted by outside culture mhm and to and see then, what's missing and uh and then to bring it back into the culture at large it's just it's very beautiful uh as a cycle of what to do and the outside culture then is enriched by what we bring back. Totally. Mm-hmm. Certainly. Yeah. yeah. And that's even, I mean, as in, in ancient times, how we separated more frequently with our menstrual cycles and then brought brought that back into the culture, the, the dream times, the prophecies, those kinds of things that, mm-hmm. that we're able to even touch when we're in in that cultural immersion, I won't say separation, but but in that cultural immersion time of our of our cycle, um, and then bring it back into the culture. It was indeed those prophecies is what helped everybody to go forward sustainably, <laughs> peacefully, uh, in wisdom. So, um, so in your book, in a simple revolution, you talked about when when you women lived together, your menstrual cycles synchronized. And I'm wondering if the women listening to the interview are are experiencing the same uh, act of nature in their households. I have three daughters, and certainly living together, all of us in our woman household, we were certainly synchronizing. All right, it's amazing how that happens. You know, of course it can be disrupted if you're a stewardess, for example, or working under particular kinds of bright lights. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, we see that in our program. We'll have people will uh, begin to menstruate, and even women who hadn't been menstruating for a year or two and thought they were just thoroughly into uh, menopause, and at the end of it sometimes they they have a period. Just from being together, it's just a hormonal thing that happens. Very amazing. <laughs> um, so when we're talking about sensibilities, uh, lesbian sensibilities, I recently learned um, about the sensibilities of millennials, the 20 and 30-year-olds. And their priorities are 
so similar. They're living green. They're, it's higher education, good parenting, fairness and opportunity for all, and being happy. Um, and certainly every every lesbian I know lives green. You know, we're all interested in fairness and opportunities for all. Um, so with lesbians and millennials together and women rising around the world, I, uh, how can we go wrong? It seems like there's a lot of hope uh, in the direction that, that humans are evolving into. Do you have hope for the world, Judy? In oh, yes. The I, we're moving in? I totally do. You know, I think that we're we're remarkable. We're remarkably adaptable, and uh, we're just incredibly smart. It's not that we're smarter than nature or nothing like that, but we're part of nature, and uh, we, you know, we learn as we go along. I have a lot of confidence that people are going to be uh, using science. Uh, as we go, I think one of the biggest problems is how people can get along with each other, and I think the key to that is in women. I, what I wish for women is the confidence to assert ourselves and experiment and so on and figure out how we can uh, devise methods uh, that would translate to uh, really transforming the world, really honest discussions of what is needed um, to help people get along because right now we're seeing um, automation take jobs away from workers, which does nothing but you know divide, separate people, and make them terrified and anguished. Uh, so we have to invent a new economy. It's imperative. There's no uh, if, ands, or buts about it. it must happen. Uh, and learn how to share and how to take people who are displaced, you know, by enormous storms that come along. Um, but overall, I have every confidence that we'll do that and that the new generation will see what it is, what's the simple revolution that they have to do. And a simple revolution means that you can use intuition and spirituality to help you figure out what needs to happen and not do something mechanistic or by rote or just because somebody's book says ABC. It might not be ABC at all that's needed. It might be, might be something entirely different and usually is. So uh, I, I just think that the, uh, the millennials and the people who follow after them are going to do each of them, each generation with their peers, simple revolutions that keep uh, keep things moving along. So I'm not pessimistic at all. I, I agree with you. And I think that these these points that you're making, they must come up in the in the discussions with your students and in the um in the studies as they're trying to figure out how to go forward in their own lives and how to use their gifts out in the world. Oh yes, I think that these are discussions that go on all over Sophia University. Um, yeah, from you know, from the bachelor completion to the PhDs, uh, this is, these are the issues that people are talking about: how to lead ethical lives, how to have uh, their spirituality be a meaningful part of everyday life, and how to have an impact on the world mm -hmm. in a good way. Yeah. Yes, in a good way. All right, Judy, uh, we're nearing the end of our interview, and I have to ask you to bless us with one of your poems. Do you oh, have all right. a favorite? <laughs> Something that you want to leave us with? Well, since we've been talking so much about uh, women and women-centeredness, and you had suggested this poem. I actually wrote this poem back in 1969, um, and uh, I'd like to read the whole thing. It's called uh, Vera from My Childhood, and it's the seventh of the common woman poems. Uh, Thank you. I, I wrote these seven poems because I wanted uh, a, a, a consciousness-raising group that would include all the people I knew. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> so I wrote them into poetry. <laughs> That's what all poets right. do. We just invent the world. <laughs> Thank so you. here we go, uh, Vera from my childhood. <laughs> Solemnly swearing to swear is an oath to you who have somehow gotten to be a pale old woman. 
swearing as if an oath could be wrapped around your shoulders like a new coat. For your $28 a week and the bastard boss you never let yourself hate, and the work, all the work you did at home where you never got paid. For your mouth that got thinner and thinner until it disappeared as if you had choked on it, watching the hard liquor break your fine husband down into a dead joke. For the strange mole, like a third eye, right in the middle of your forehead. For your religion, which insisted that people are beautiful golden birds and must be preserved. For your persistent nerve and plain talk. The common woman is as common as good bread, as common as when you couldn't go on but did. For all the world, we didn't know we held in common all along. The common woman is as common as the best of bread and will rise and will become strong. I swear it to you. I swear it to you on my own head. I swear it to you on my common woman's head. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're welcome, Jenny. Thank, Thank you, you Thank for you. interviewing me, letting me talk on and on like this. Well, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. And um, so I want to just go over some of the links that we have for you. Um, we have Judy Gron in Cyberspace, and you can find that website at judygron.org. That's Judy, G-R-A-H-N. Dot org, And we have a link for the Masters in Women's Spirituality program at Sophia University. And we also have a link for, uh, for Judy's book, Blood, Bread, and Roses, and, uh, and for her newest book, A Simple Revolution, The Making of an Activist Poet, and that's at antloot.com. And also for your article on uh, ancient horticulture in Metaphormia. So that's metaformia, M-E-T-A-F-O-R-M-I-A dot org. So we have all of those links available. And I just want to say thank you very much for all the work that you've done in the past and all the great work you're going to continue to do in the future for sure. <laughs> thank you. Thanks a lot, Jenny. Uh, and uh, thank you for uh, everything that you're doing on Green Woman Store uh, and for um, – you know your uh, your love of sustainability and what you're doing for it. Thanks a lot. And thank you, thank you, Judy, and thank you for keeping our ancient teachings alive through your master's course, and with your poetry and with your books. So I want to say um, thank you to all of you who are listening and who joined in for our talk on Le- at Lean Into Green. Going green is a journey. It's a personal journey and a collective one. And you may want to invite your family and friends to listen in as well. Our experts provide a wealth of information as well as tips and tools for going green, spiritually, politically, economically. I hope you will take some time to make leaning into green a priority in your life. And I hope that we've inspired you today to go green in many new and rewarding ways. Keep listening as we all lean into green a little deeper on our collective quest toward sustainability.